Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second event for 2021. That's part of conversations about Ella Montgomery. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Benjamin Lefebvre. I'm director of the web resource Ella Montgomery Online and editor of uh, the Ella Montgomery Library, which is a series of books collecting Montgomery's long lost, mostly long lost periodical pieces. I'm joined today by several people who are part of the steering committee of this initiative. And we are very pleased to welcome you to today's event, which has to do with Ella Montgomery's character pairs. Given that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, we thought this would be a good opportunity to think not only about romantic couples, but also about different kinds of pairs of characters. So that includes best friends, enemies, um, child and adult pairs, and people who, for whatever reason, connect to each other, either temporarily or, or, or as part of the resolution of a story and um, learn and grow from each other. So we have, uh, we're very happy to see all of you today. And so uh, just to uh, sum up a few things that have already come up, um, we announced a few minutes ago that the next book that we are going to be reading as part of the Ella Montgomery Readathon on Facebook will be Chronicles of Avonlea, a collection of linked short stories that Montgomery published in 1912 um, using as her starting point stories that she had already written for periodicals. Um, partly, and she, she put this book together partly because she had no new novel ready and partly because she was trying to fend off her publisher and many of her readers who couldn't wait to have a more about Anne. And she just was not ready to face the prospect of, of seeing Anne to the altar. Chronicles of Avonlea is also significant, a significant book for those of us who are interested in Montgomery's broader legacy within popular culture, because it was one of the books that formed the basis for the ever popular television series, Road to Avonlea. Um, we're doing a Montgomery cooking, baking, and crafting challenge, and you are welcome to post about any cooking, baking, and crafting that you have done that's Montgomery related. Post your pictures, post your recipes, post your knitting patterns, um, anything Montgomery related that's a cooking, baking, or crafting item. Um, we would love to see it and see pictures, and you can also post videos, but we won't edit them for you. So that's pretty much it. And it's gonna run from uh, Valentine's Day to Easter. So now and through April 5th. Thank you, you very go. much, Sarah. We're okay. so excited about that. Mm -hmm. I will now turn this over to Caroline. Um, just a reminder too, that it, uh, if you uh, want to bring up a new topic of conversation, just mention it in the chat and we can, we'll find, we'll find time for you. Okay, great. Caroline, take it away. Our first contributor, uh, Anna Johnson, who is going to be talking about Pat and Jingle. So the reason that I want to talk about them is because I think that they are really compatible. You don't really see that very often in Montgomery's books where um, a couple is really um, like on the same page about stuff. They both love animals. They love the Silverbush kitchen and hanging out there. They're both thrilled over poetry. They both love houses. They occasionally disagree over things that's like <laughs> the placement of trees, but they generally agree on the houses that they like best. And Jingle becomes an architect because of his love of houses, which mirrors Pat's. So you really get a sense of really of their friendship throughout the two books, um, even though Jingle doesn't really appear much in the second book. If you can compare them to like Anne and Gilbert, Gilbert doesn't really <laughs> appear very much um, in the first book. He has only like nine lines and Jingle is just so much more of a fleshed out character. And that I think is just really satisfying um, that he's such a prominent character in that first book. And also coming back at the, you know, the grand finale of the second one. I, yeah, I just think that they're really, really satisfying. I'm much more interesting as a pair than most other um, Montgomery couples. 
there's a great line in toward the end of the first book and it's when the beautiful copper beach at the top of the hill field flew blew down in a terrific march gale it was hillary jingle who understood her grief and comforted her this is just such a lovely line that truly captures their relationship um, Jingle understands how Pat feels about a tree falling down, whereas her current boyfriend at the time says, you know, aren't there any number of trees left in the world? And Jingle's response is, there are any number of people left in the world when someone dies, but that doesn't mend the grief of those who love him. Um, so Pat and Jingle really have the same sentimentality, and that's what makes them such a compelling pair. So that's why I wanted to talk about them. Ooh, thank you, Anna. That is Beautiful. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on Pat and Jingle? All right, then. Uh, we will move on. And if you think of something belatedly, just stick it in the chat and we can all enjoy it. Um, so Allison Hudson, Emily and Cousin Jimmy. I'm really enthusiastic about, about the Emily series. So just um, tell me to shut up if I go on too long, but I took a few minutes. <laughs> I'll try to um, I just love Emily and cousin Jimmy. It's such an ideal relationship. They're so mutually supportive and almost too perfect maybe, but I, I choose to ignore that because it's just so pure and lovely. Um, they have a relationship of mutual understanding and empathy. They're definitely kindred spirits. Um, Cousin Jimmy's support in particular is vital to Emily's emotional development. Um, he tells her stories about New Moon when she first arrives and makes her feel at home and part of the clan when others maybe not so much. Um, he notices her Murray tendencies, even though she you know, claims to be star and nothing else. Um, he's definitely her biggest supporter in terms of her writing career. Jimmy provides her writing material that she doesn't otherwise get helps her get her book published. Um, he never withholds praise like some of her other relatives do. He's the perfect antidote to Aunt Elizabeth and to Dean, who I think is very toxic and possessive and horrible. Um, and unlike Aunt Laura, he supports her without fear of Aunt Elizabeth. He just doesn't care. He just does what he wants. He's ungrudgingly happy for her success, even though he missed out on his own success. Um, He's not bitter, even though he lacks whatever it is that she has. Um, and he's generally, genuinely happy for her, um, especially when she finds the lost diamond and gets her book published and all of those things. Um, I think Montgomery makes it less clear what, what Emily provides for Jimmy, but he just seems genuinely happy to love her and to know her and enjoy her company. Um, the only thing about him that scares her a little bit is her sort of, is his uncanniness. Um, the, the blank spots or whatever. So the quote that I was going to read was the bit from the beginning where she's showing him his garden. And he says, and what about my garden? Demanded cousin Jimmy jealously. It's fit for a queen, said Emily gravely and sincerely. Cousin Jimmy nodded, well pleased. And then a strange sound crept into his voice and an odd look into his eyes. There's a spell woven around this garden. The blight shall spare it and the green worm pass it by. Drought dares not invade it, and the rain comes here gently. Emily took an involuntary step backward. She almost felt like running away, but now Cousin Jimmy was himself again. I just love the, the gothic stuff throughout this whole trilogy, and, and that's almost a foreshadowing of um, her own. She hasn't started having her bits of second sight or whatever yet, but um, she uh, becomes a lot more like that even than he does. So they're just such a great pair. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, other thoughts on Cousin Jimmy and Emily? Um, I had an it's, email. Oh, yes. Oh, Caroline, sorry. This is Sarah. I was just thinking about, you know, the fact that, I mean, Cousin Jimmy provides so much encouragement for Emily, but he also provides, she, she also provides sort of validation for him right he's like looked at by a lot of people as so strange and eccentric and even by elizabeth and laura as still the you know kid who had the stump thrown at his head right and you know she 
looks up to him and really cherishes him. And I feel like that's a such a lovely relationship. So I see Corey's raising her hand over there also. Corey. This mention of cousin Jimmy reminds me that it seems I've read somewhere that Lucy Maud Montgomery did base his character on somebody in her life. And I can't remember who, whom. I wonder if anyone else remembers. Um, she often said that, that well, uh, she often said in, in, in her autobiographical writings that she had a cousin, Hector McNeil, who um, was, a, was a minor Scottish poet and some of his best known works were sometimes erroneously attributed to Burns. But I believe Mary Rubio and Elizabeth Waterston in their annotations of this in the journals, they put it very diplomatically and they think they say um, the, the, his connection to the Cavendish McNeils has not been confirmed. So it's, so he would have been a great uncle or, or, or a grandfather's cousin or something like that. Um, but I don't know if he had uh, a similar impairment that cousin Jimmy had, but he was, he was a poet, except in his case, of course, his, his poems were written down. Uh, right, uh, that's interesting. I just seem to recall vaguely that somewhere in her journals, she meant, mentioned someone like whom you say, and um, that uh, they were considered eccentric and odd, and, but they were a poet. And uh, so that may be the person that um, was mentioned that, you, that you've referred to, Ben. So thank you. I'm torn between wanting to say something about Cousin Jimmy and Emily because I love them. Um, <laughs> or wanting to move on. Um, in the chat, I see a couple of um, comments. Um, Ko says that um, she likes the, the pairs of the, the girl or the younger woman with the older man. Um, uh, notably not Dean Priest, but Emily and Cousin Jimmy, because of that mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and I agree because they are such, it was the only thing that um, reconciled me. Well, I was okay that Emily was going with Aunt Laura, but Aunt Elizabeth was extremely formidable. And the fact that Emily had cousin Jimmy firmly in her corner was the thing that made me realize it was gonna be okay. Um, Lisa Anderson, you had several, and I would ask you to start with Esme and Steven. Sure. Um, so I just finished rereading The Blies Are Quoted, and one of my favorite stories was looking at uh, Fancy School, and I think one of the reasons why I really, really love this story is it gives you something what I'm going to call the Montgomery feeling, and I think for me the Montgomery feeling is when everything comes together, all's well that ends well, a happy ending, and couples are coming together. And I think we start to see that in the Blue Castle that we've been reading uh, when we find out um, that Barney is uh, Mr. Redford's son and he is John Foster and it's all coming together. And that's what I really, really like about this story. So Ismay is actually uh, thinking about being engaged to Stephen's cousin, who is a very and it brings up that this cousin is actually, from what I understand, Diana Barry's son. And that made me uh, think a little bit more about that relationship uh, with Diana Barry and Anne too. But uh, focusing on Ismay and, and Stephen, it's almost like a ghost story because uh, Ismay is engaged to Stephen's cousin. Um, and she sees a picture of the cousin's great Uncle Francis on the wall, but she believes that she's seen this man before, but he is a sea captain and he dies and passes away. So how could she possibly, but she has met a man that looks like this great Uncle Francis um, in the garden, which is believed to be haunted when she was eight years old. And they walk hand in hand together. They talk, 
they dance, they laugh, they're the best of comrades. And when she tells a story to the cousin who she's thinking about uh, being married to, he laughs about her story and she realizes that this cousin is not the right man for her. She just can't marry him. And Dr. Blythe, so Gilbert Blythe, is quoted as saying it was a shame that she was going to marry this cousin because he knew something about him. Um, mm. And she felt that she liked the cousin well enough as a friend, but she didn't know how she was going to like him as a husband. And I really believe that she's really um, attracted to great uncle Francis's picture on the wall and to this man. And she goes into the garden again after she's decided not to marry the cousin. And I think we see Lucy Mont Montgomery's uh, fate and providence that she uses when she meets this ghost again, who really is not a ghost at all. It happens to be um, Stephen Barry. And he is a young man. So he's not actually a ghost. Um, he is actually, um, he looks exactly like great uncle Francis, who was the man, uh, picture who was on the wall. And he has been told by his family members, he looks exactly alike, uh, like great uncle Francis and his middle name is Francis. So he's really Stephen Francis Barry. And so when they meet again in the garden, um, he is willing to sit and hear Ismay out in her story. And he doesn't laugh at her. So I feel like Montgomery is setting up Stephen and Ismay as kindred spirits. Uh, she's setting them up as a right match. And we don't learn more about the relationship um, between Ismay and Stephen, but we do learn that he is working, um, working, I believe something to do with science, something to do with worms, which was really interesting. And it does say that years later, uh, Stephen Barry and Jim Blythe will share a German prison after some years. Um, but I feel like, you know, this is going to be a happy ending. I feel we're going to see Stephen and Ismay get married and gives you that Montgomery feeling that they're going to end up together in a happy match. And my favorite quote uh, from this story is Dr. Bly. So Dr. Gilbert Bly saying, I met Stephen Barry for a moment today. He is really a splendid fellow. I wish he and Ismay Dally would meet and fall in love. Oh, they would suit each other. Oh, thank you. Um, thank That's you. lovely. How many, um, how many of the rest of us have read that story or remember it? I've I'm read raising it. my hand, but you can't see. Uh, <laughs> So that's kind of an interesting combination of the uh, the younger woman, younger girl, older man, but maybe not that much older, um, but more truly and more importantly, perhaps the kindred spirit connection, that, that sense of friendship and understanding and respect as opposed to dismissal, which we saw with the first fiance. <sighs> Okay, Lisa, I may come back to you for some of your others, but I want to move on to um, Mary Eve um, and then Rebecca Brown talking about Anne and Leslie. Hello, everyone. I got up this morning and the furnace wasn't working. It was it's 12 degrees in here, which is about 54 Fahrenheit. So I'm, I'm wearing my gloves and my blanket and everything else, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I chose... Anne and Leslie, because I think the chapter Barriers Swept Away is so beautiful. And I'm so grateful to all the, the friends I've made through our mutual love of L.M. Montgomery over the years, starting in 90, 1995, um, when I joined the Kindred Spirits email list. And almost every year, I meet two very close friends in Flo when I'm in Florida, which of course isn't happening this year. And we've just become so close over the years. And uh, two years ago, um, my one friend, her husband died very suddenly from a brain aneurysm. And I was there for the whole thing. And it just brought us so much closer together. And I even said, our, our friendship has gone from Anne and Diana to Anne and Leslie. And I'm, 
so glad for um, our little Hamilton Society, where I have made so many friends as well. And um, I've, I heard a saying that um, joy shared is joy multiplied and grief shared is grief divided. And that is so true, I think, in a, in a group of friends, because over the years, um, we've gone to weddings, unfortunately, funerals. Um, I had a baby shower when I be became a grandmother and all my kindred spirit friends came. And it just so grateful to Maude for, I feel sorry for her because she didn't get that many friendships, especially as she was older. And uh, I just feel so blessed to have so many good friends in my life, some of whom are here today. And I just wanted to finish with the last chapter of Barrier, the last paragraph, not the last chapter, I won't read a chapter, the last paragraph of Barrier Swept Away because it's so beautiful. You know me now, Anne, the worst of me, the barriers are all down and you still want to be my friend? Anne looked up through the birches at the white paper lantern of a half moon drifting downwards to the Gulf of Sunset. Her face was very sweet. I am your friend and you are mine for always, she said, such a friend as I never had before. I have had many dear and beloved friends, but there is something in you, Leslie, that I never found in anyone else. You have more to offer me in that rich nature of yours, and I have more to give you than I had in my careless girlhood. We are both women and friends forever. They clasped hands and smiled at each other through the tears that filled the gray eyes and the blue. So thank you all for being my friend. It means a lot to me. Thank you. That was lovely and so true. So true. Rebecca. Right. I should, I should change my thing. I'm really called Becky. I'm called Rebecca, but I'm always excuse Becky. So anyway. All right. Um, what I love about this book is that um, and 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 breaks down these barriers. It's, the first time she she properly meets her, but they're looking at the sea, and they they they, they like, both like the sea. They both say they love the sea, and they, they actually start getting together then. And then such a lot happens in this book. When I read, when I read the blurb before I read it the first time, I thought it was very unusual to have a disabled husband in a book like this. Um, so that was that was intriguing as I, as I read it. And then basically, as I went along, they, their friendship gets really starts forming. Although Leslie, of course, is very unhappy because she's got this brain damaged husband, she thinks. Um, as it goes along, it gets better and better. And then Anne loses the baby. And it's heartbreaking. That chapter is absolutely heartbreaking. When she loses the baby, the baby dies, even though it's the baby survived the labor. And uh, as it goes on, and then well, and then, of course, then you have Anne not wanting Dick to have the op operation because he'll come back and, he and he'll be horrible to Leslie again. And she doesn't want him to have the operation. And Gilbert's saying, don't be, don't be silly, we, we can give him a chance. We can give him this operation. So she gives in in the end. And then, of course, I just love the bit um, where, where Gilbert comes back home. He doesn't know what's happened. And Anne's really excited. <laughs> And, and she's not making any sense at all. And she says, oh, Gilbert, you were right, so right. I can see that clearly enough now, and I'm so ashamed of myself. Will you ever really forgive me? Anne, I'll shake you if you don't get grown more coherent. Redmond would be ashamed of you. What has happened? And she finally, finally says, it. there is no dick. There is no dick, it's his cousin. And it's a wonderful, wonderful moment. And then, of course, you have these shenanigans of, of, of Owen coming back and, and, and Leslie's being very silly and, and just talks to her sensibly and gets to see it's not a problem, he's in love with you, it's going to be all right. And it's a wonderful book and it's a very adult book, very adult book, I think. In a way, The Blue Castle is also a very adult book and I love that book too. Um, and I think that's all I've got to say, really. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Yes, I do love Anne and Leslie. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Well, one thing I've, I've always wondered about is, um, 
you know, as Mary Ann says it, it, in, in the, the extract that she read at the end of that chapter, you know, we're friends forever, but Leslie never appears in any of the other books. So what, like, what does, what does that do in terms of thinking about, about um, conflict and how once there's no conflict, there's no presence. Montgomery often does this where characters that appear in one book and have a strong story arc, they don't come back because, or they're mentioned in passing and they don't really do anything because there's nothing left for them to do seemingly. So, so what do you make of the fact, and this is, I guess what I'm asking, what do you think of the, the, the fact that here Montgomery is depicting friendship at a time of upheaval, but once that upheaval is done, then there's no mention of that friendship, or there's hardly any friend, a mention of those friendships again. Beth, what do you think? Well, um, I'm looking at my bookshelf to see the order of the books. <laughs> and uh, Anne's House of Dreams is, it's kind of the last Anne book. Um, because after that, you've got Rainbow Valley, it's the kids, Rilla, it's the kid. Um, and then there's books written retroactively, Anne of Wendy Poplars, which precedes Leslie, and Anne of Ingleside, which actually she could be in that one, I guess. Um, so uh, she kind of, uh, it seems to me, she kind of ran out of storyline. And <clears throat> um, we don't get that sequel to Anne's House of Dreams with uh, centering Anne so much um, until maybe Anne of Ingleside. So I think she forgot about her by 1938. So <laughs> that, maybe that was our last chance to, to have Leslie show up <clears throat> again. So um, maybe it's not surprising that she didn't follow through because that would have been great uh, because we don't have Anne um, experiencing that kind of uh, <clears throat> relationship after, certainly after the, that book, that's 1917, 1916. So um, I don't know, I can't draw any other uh, ideas out of that, I guess. Yeah, the only, well, um, I mean, Kate is pointing out in the chat that Leslie moved to Toronto, but to me, like, yeah. The promise right. at the end of Anne's House of Dreams is like, well, we've bought, we'll buy the house of dreams. It'll be our summer vacation house. Right. We'll see right. you every summer. Like there's this, pro like we, we're told and we're, we're, we're led to believe, yes, the friendship will continue. We love each other. We're that, we'll be there for each other. But the only <laughs> other thing that Leslie does of any substance is send Rinla a pair of slippers that pinch her feet. <laughs> yeah, but I think if you're going to include that, Ben, you have to include the fact that friendship uh, in Montgomery's books extends down the generations. Mm -hmm. So we can't leave it the fact that Ken Ford is Leslie's son right. and that he and Rilla formed that relationship that is um, essentially creating that close bond in another generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and to bring Leslie into that book, quite frankly, because all of Anne's friends then have sons at the front. I mean, <laughs> Diana does, Leslie does, uh, Priscilla does, Stella does, would simply be to duplicate um, yet another mother who is suffering. And the emphasis has got to be on Rilla and Susan <laughs> and the tight-knit community of the time, I think. <clears throat> Leslie did have one line, I believe, in Rainbow Valley, where she told Ken not to get his blouse dirty. She scolded <laughs> him, and I think that was the last mention of, it, of, of her. Um, but it's nice to think that her and Anne would someday have mutual grandchildren. That would be a joy to share yeah. Jan, grandchildren together. So. Absolutely. Audrey, your pair is also from um, Anne's House of Dreams. Yes, and it's a very different pairing, uh, but I find it also very representative of Montgomery, which is um, friendship, very strong friendship uh, without any sort of loving feeling. Well, not loving, but no um, love relationship. And it's between uh, Miss Cornelia and Captain Jim, which we 
don't see as often and we obviously don't see in other books because and I hope I'm not spoiling anyone but Kat and Jim dies at the hand of Anne's House of Dream uh, but when they are together they take uh, the whole room so in the first chapter where we see them together it's Christmas at Four Winds it's Anne's first Christmas so they decide to stay at Four Winds and they invite Marilla and Mrs. Lynn and the, but the personality of Miss Cornelia and Captain Jenkins is so strong that we hardly even hear about Mrs. Rachel Lynn, who, uh, who usually takes the stage. You know, whenever she's there, she usually is uh, the focus of all the involuntary humor. But I really, I'm not going to read a lot about it, but I really invite you to go back and read this chapter because there's such great sparring between the two. And Montgomery calls them. Uh, these two old friends and antagonists and really it shines true and at some point the conversation flags down but you know Captain Jane brings back Miss Cornelia by saying oh you know what I attended a Methodist service the other day and then immediately it starts over and I just think it's very touching to see a pair of friends that I guess provide fighting material for each other so a great piece of humor I invite you to go back and read it. Oh Thank you, Audrey. That's, you know, I kind of forget about those two just because it is that one book, but they clearly respect each other and love each other, even as they function as those, we'd call them frenemies now, but they're more friends than enemies. So friendly enemies, friendly antagonists. So I like that very much. Anyone else on anybody? Any other friend pairs, enemies? Yes, Mary McKay here. Hi, Mary. Hello. Um, it was for me in the very first 87 pages of published L.M. Montgomery uh, that did it for me in Anna Green Gables with Marilla Cuthbert is surprised. I'm holding the copy of book given to me in 1963. I was 10 years old and it is my uh, at the age of 10, I was really heartwarmed at the uh, instant uh, French, um, pretty well instantaneous friendship between Matthew and Anne. Matthew, as we know, is extremely shy, introverted, hardly ever leaves the farm, not keen on women, uh, and he has the courage, Matthew does, to stand up to Marilla. And when Marilla says, well, she's not a boy, so Anne has to go back. And there's a few sentences here where Matthew has the courage to say, well, now she's a real nice little thing, Marilla. It's kind of a pity to send her back when she's set on staying here. And Marilla responds, Matthew Cuthbert, you don't mean to say you think we ought to keep her. And his response, well, no, I suppose not. Not exactly. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose we could hardly be expected to keep her. Marilla, I should say not. What good would she be to us? And here's Matthew's answer. We might be some good to her, said Matthew suddenly and unexpectedly. And, and Marilla responds, I believe that child has bewitched you. And then he states his case more and it might have been the first time Matthew ever stood up to anybody and and because um, he knows what they're taking on. And the friendship between those two, we know that Anne often went down to the barn to chat with Matthew. We know that it was Matthew that broke the 
sort of deprivation of upbringing that Anne had with the very famous in my heart puffed sleeve dress at Christmas, the string of pearls, his we know his face was just shining in love when he listened to every word that Anne ever spoke. He approached her about the missing amethyst uh, pins so that she could get out of her room to go to the picnic. He was always supporting her and her loving him. And um, I think that uh, that would have been our beloved Anna Green Gables, first person in her whole life that loved her for exactly who she was. Um, and with a, he loved her with like, in my opinion, with the heart of a lion. Oh, that's beautifully said, Mary. Thank you. And I agree. Though Marilla grows to love her, but she grow she, you know, she's a little slower to figure it out than Matthew was. Matthew was smitten. I'm sure he was in complete shock driving that buggy back to Green Gables with this little waif in the front seat talking incessantly because Matthew was a very secluded and sheltered reclusive man. He must have thought he'd stepped into a, a, I'll say, a Tolkien book. He must have thought he was in Hobbit land. <laughs> so if I could just add to that, that chat point. Um, so I don't agree with, um, you know, I think the Anne Matthew pairing is exceptionally important, but I don't agree that all the female friendships in Avonlea or even most of feminine Avonlea discourse is a constant round of news gossip. Uh, I don't think male companions are the only ones who are important here. I think Anne, Anne, Anne's imagination and creativity and sense of home were also nurtured by people like Diana. Mm -hmm. um, and that those kinds of friendships are equally important. And I take this one comment as about only the Anne books. Um, because I see other female friendships like Emily and Ilso, we've been having a lively conversation about them in the chat, um, are just as important. Female pairings are incredibly important through Ed Montgomery's works. So I'll stop talking there and let others, because I saw some hands go up. Yeah, Leo, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Thanks. I just wanted to build on that comment about uh, Matthew and Marilla and just say that some of my Favorite pairings are those brother-sister uh, relationships. You see it with Matthew and Marilla, you see it with David and Suzanne Kirk, and it's a trope in so much of her magazine stories. And when you're talking about sacrifices and things like that, those sibling pairs are always, uh, always shown as sacrificing for each other, trying to put the other sibling ahead, trying to do things for the siblings. And I just think it's such an interesting contrast because all of her main characters, most of her main characters, maybe with Pat as an exception, are only children or orphans. So I just think it's interesting that she wove so many sibling pairs into her work and almost unfailingly how supportive they are of each other. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, that's really interesting because I'm. she was an only child and I'm wondering, and I'm an only child, and I'm wondering if that's one reason her sibling pairs are so universally supportive. Little did she know, right? Yeah, a little bit idealized maybe. Um, They're plot devices too. Yes, I agree with yes. you. Though. They're almost yes. universally idealized. And then when so, it comes to the ants, th then the relationships change completely. Yeah, they do. And, and, and Lori pointed out that, yeah, Montgomery did in fact have those half siblings, but, you know, she lived with them for a year and they were so much younger. She was, you know, effectively raised as an only child. Um, but, and the, the sibling partnership that comes to me is Pat and Sid and Sid is just such a jackass. I'm sorry to use such coarse language, but very, very coarse. I'm I'm sorry, but Sid is you know Sid is the, kind of the exception there. 
he is not trying to put Pat first, but she is always, always considering him. Well, and of and course, then, that, 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 that one way street of consideration, the sister toward the brother uh, also takes, is, all, is also lethal in one of the further Chronicles of Avonlea stories um, in, in, um, in her selfless- Spoiler story. alert. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, though this is further chronicles. We're not. We're not. We're. We're. That that will be. That will be happening later. But there, the. Um, okay, fine. I'll. I'll. Uh, I'll. I won't give the plot away. But let's just say that uh, the 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 pattern of uh, mutual, not even mutual, but one way support ends up ends up being quite lethal. Uh, Corey, what do you want? What, what do you have to say? Oh, just um, on the subject of um, siblings, and um, again, I've been reading Montgomery's journals, and in one of her later journals, she talks in, I think, a fairly long paragraph about how she wished she ha had had an older brother, like not the younger half-siblings that she had through her father's later marriage, but she, she talks very, very um, sadly that... Um, she had no siblings and, and her craving and her pining for an older brother. And she, she even says, quote, some, somebody who maybe looks a little bit like me and who would guide me and help me. I, I can't remember exactly how she expressed it, but you can just see that she, she, she lost her mother. Her father uh, left her to be raised by her grandmother and grandfather. And that, of course, you know, the, the grandfather was in many ways, um, a very difficult man to live with and, and to some extent her grandmother was too and and so she didn't really have that unconditional love I mean she had it but they they couldn't demonstrate it whereas I guess she she fantasized that if she had had an older brother someone who maybe looked a little bit like her um, he would love her unconditionally and guide her where she needed guidance and um, even later on in her adulthood she felt she had so little guidance in some ways from a kindred spirit of, of um, a family of blood, you know? And um, it, so maybe in her fiction, the, the reason, uh, one of the reasons why she, um, uh, you know, paints the, the friendships so strongly is um, because she made an effort to make the kindred spirit friendships that she made because she didn't have siblings she could make them with that unconditional love. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> hey, thanks, Corey. Um, Andrea suggests that we consider the similarities and differences between Miss Cornelia and Susan. <laughs> and before that, we were having a lively discussion about Emily and Ilsa, if anybody would like to contribute to that. Um, and I see coming up in the chat that Sarah's saying, can Susan and Miss Cornelia be called friends? No, but we're just doing pairings. There's, there's considerable competition there that adds interest yeah. to the book. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, Susan dressing up with the four inch lace on her apron because Miss Cornelia is coming for tea or whatever. And they spark off each other. But in some ways... Um, you know, they, they serve the same purpose, which is to add this practical layer, almost this sparky layer of cutting through the sentimentality. Well, and, and don't forget that she pairs Susan up with Rebecca Dew later, right? And that's super fun to see those two sort of mm -hmm. chatting away over a good bite. And then you get Miss Cornelia with, um, oh, what are the what it's Rosemary and what's the sister Ellen? Is yeah, Rosemary Ellen and Douglas. Yes. And yes. Ellen, she seems like she seems like a um, a good one to go up against Miss Cornelia. The two of them with their their opinions. So there's quite a lot of lively older women with things to talk about besides just gossip. Yeah. Especially when you get into the World War One, cursing mm -hmm. the Kaiser and all that kind of fun. Well, I always oh, felt, what? Um, felt that, um, you know, Miss Cornelia, I was always surprised that at some point we didn't see her lugging a pot of boiling dye. 
you know, <laughs> in preparation for throwing it over somebody who had proposed to her, but I thought it was brilliant. Drat the men. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm sort of segueing off um, someone's earlier comments about Miss Cornelian. I think it might have been Audrey. Yeah. yeah. And that so made me Audrey think for of Judy Plum and Tilly Tuck. <clears throat> oh. Oh, friendly God. enemies. <clears throat> it's been way too long since I've read it, but I just remember how Judy always jived at him when he told his wild stories. Yes. And yet when he's gone, they do miss him shockingly, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we could have a discussion about the nature of friendship and how, Montgomery doesn't obviously paint friendship in the same way all the time. I think the pairing of Judy and Tilly Tuck is such a great example of how you don't have to agree about everything. You can needle one another and yet still have that true, I will look after you should anything happen underlying it. So there can be prickly friendship. Absolutely. Um, and it's a fascinating study in and of itself. But there's also the difference between friends who are friends by choice and friends who are brought together against their will, either because they have a mutual friend that they're both interested in or because they're both employed by a house. So Judy and Tilly Tuck have no choice. Like they, they're kind of stuck together in that kitchen <laughs> because they're both employed there. Um, and even, even Susan and Mrs. Elliot like Miss Cornelia, it doesn't go visiting to Ingleside to talk to Susan. It's to talk to Anne, and Susan just happens to be there because she works there. So they put up with each other mainly because, or arguably because they have no choice. Yes, and I love Susan's um, somewhat disdainful uh, refusal to to keep calling Miss Cornelia Miss Cornelia. She is you know, from then on, uh, Mrs. Marshall Elliott. Um, it's like, you wanted to be married? Well, you're going to get all the perks of being married, darn it. <laughs> so I do enjoy that a lot. And I, I'm with Andrea. I love, I love Emily and Ilse. They are one of my favorites and everything Andrea said, and I'm going to go back to that comment if I can find it, because it's very much one of those, um, it's a more mature friendship as we see it develop. And even from the beginning, um, they fight and they disagree and they let it all hang out with each other. And yet they still love each other so much. And, you know, once Emily figures out, oh, wait a minute, this is just Ilse, she's, uh, she's like, oh, well, you know what, I can fight too. Ha, so there, and she does, but, um, and of course, the hardest thing for me about reading the third Emily book is that distance between those two friends. It's, I mean... Well, there are a lot of hard things about reading that book, including the fact that Emily's engaged to Dean Priest. But the distance between, I just feel like that, you know, if she and Elsie had been talking, Elsie would have been able to say, Emily, dear Lord, what are you thinking? That is insane. I, think I always thought it would have been kind of interesting to have been married to Dean, far more interesting than to Teddy. But that's not my comment. I really like to <laughs> think of this particular friendship between Emily and Ilsa. And nobody's saying anything. So back to Ben. Aww. Well, has anyone, like someone, I think on, on the readathon brought up Emily and Dean, because that's always, that's always a ripe uh, uh, pair for conversation. So who wants to talk about Emily and Dean? Um, Corey, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I believe 
that in some ways the relationship between Emily and Dean, um, it, it, it doesn't really ever progress in, in, a, in a complex way. It, he starts out in the first Emily, Emily, uh, um, the first book, the New Moon Emily. Um, he starts out as somebody who's quite likable um, and um, he, he seems to appreciate her uh, ability uh, with her writing at that point and her poetic nature. He has a poetic nature and they discuss literature, as I recall, and um, he supports her, he saves her life, I think, in, in that first book, doesn't he? And, um, and then um, in the second and third books, especially the third one, he becomes creepier and somehow you can understand why she certainly doesn't grow to love him and uh, likes him even less as, as the book, the trilogy progresses and the third book, especially she, she um, he's not as likable. He's, he's become some uh, more, more creepy. And um, so I find that a rather in interesting progression of his character. And, and then certainly you're turned off because um, he, uh, when she uh, is it with her first novel, he tells her it's no good and she believes him without even think she just believes him and um, doesn't question his opinion and then burns her book. And so, of course, we all, all hate him for it. And I don't think he can ever redeem himself. But I don't really find him, in, especially in the third book, to be a very fleshed out character anymore. And um, it was almost like as if um, Montgomery didn't know what to do with him in the third book. Should she make him the, uh, finally make him the husband of Emily or she, she, it was like she wasn't quite sure what to do with him as, as a character. And that's how he ends up in her third book. And uh, it, yeah, I think he, it was um, an am, ambivalent uh, character for Lucy Maud Montgomery in that third book. And he kind of came out that way, maybe unexpectedly for her too. Yeah, thanks very much, Corey. Um, yeah, Montgomery was, um, I forget if I, if I, where I would have included this if I did in one of, in one of my own books, but the, uh, I did come across a clipping in her scrapbooks from uh, of a, an article that Montgomery published or a letter that she wrote and it was it was published between Emily Climbs and Emily's Quest and it's the the, the headline is something like um, Montgomery you know popular author does not know how to end a uh, trilogy and like I'm getting all these letters from people who want me to want Emily to marry Dean and then I have letters that people who want her to marry Teddy and I just can't decide and so she she went she did go publicly saying yeah I don't know yet we'll see I well, Montgomery was also very reluctant to write that third book at all um and and she she put it off and she started it and then put it on hold and wrote the blue castle kind of as a palate cleanser but uh, but she yeah she didn't know she didn't really know where where she wanted to go or where she thought she could go. Yeah, I will ne never forget reading in her journals. I think it was the Nora Val ones by by then, um, and uh, I was just in shock. She says in like one line, she says, "Well, I finally finished uh, the third Emily book." She says, "It's no good. How can it be? I haven't had time to." Sit and concentrate on it or some such thing but but her words she says I finally finished it it's no good how can it be and then she goes on to talk about how busy she'd been and so many things happening in her life and her heart wasn't in it and I was in shock I thought that whole third Emily book she says it's no good like she says that herself it's no good I thought how can this be <laughs> you know but she let it be published and everyone wanted it and her heart wasn't in it. You, you can kind of tell when you read it. There's yeah. certain lovely things about it, but her heart certainly wasn't in it the way it was in the first Emily book. It seems evident. Yes, yeah. and, and she did mention, I think, to uh, one of her pen pals that um, she really didn't know what to do with it. And she hates kind of moving into the second or third uh, because she quote, 
can't write a young girl as she should be. You know, she has to kind of sweeten her up for the publisher and the public is the implication. Um, and I think I'm kind of with Andrea that it would have been very interesting to marry Emily off to Dean, but only if Dean had not been so creepy and controlling. And when I first read the Emily books, when I was probably 11, 10 or 11, I went right over that whole creepy, you know, I didn't like the, your life belongs to me now, but I read it kind of as a, you know, just a cliche. And I went, I just glossed right over the whole, I think I'll wait for you because I was 11 and it didn't bother me at all. As I reread, which I did all the time, um, and I got older, it started, then I was like, ew, Dean, ew. But since I was pleasantly disposed to him because I didn't read the last two books for years until, I don't know, I, I just reread Emily, the first one over and over because I didn't have access to the last two because they weren't in print in the US in paperback. And my grandmother was not gonna let me have the uh, family copies because they were too fragile. So I had to grow up before I read Emily Climbs and Emily's Quest. And so by the time I got to Emily's Quest, I was just horrified by what Dean had turned into. So we're getting a lot of comments in the chat that actually agree with you, Emily. And um, not to disrupt Ben's function, but I'm also looking at the time and going in someone's quarter after three. And it would be so nice to end this with a happy pairing, like the King family, for instance, from the Story Girl. Yeah. Anyone want to talk about the King family? Many of whom showed up and rode to Avonlea. Yes. I'll jump in and say that I really love um, the King family. Uh, as a young girl, I had a friend who uh, introduced me to the Story Girl book, and I only knew about the Anne book. So I just love the, the King family um, and how Montgomery portrays all of those characters. And I think living in rural um, Ontario, those characters really resonated with me, and I could see those characters in some of the people living in in the small town, right? So I'm really excited to be reading uh, Chronicles of, of Avonlea coming up as our, our next book. And I just really love how Montgomery always has a character who is kind of, you know, we see, I'm going to say not, not mean every will, but like Aunt Elizabeth um, and, and Emily and then, you know, Aunt Laura. And then we see um, Aunt Olivia and Aunt Hetty um, and Aunt Janet and just that pairing. It's, it's really great. You have characters who are, are very lovable and who are very standoffish, almost as mean. I just, I love how the whole King family loves the whole rest of the King family and how they bring in Sarah Ray and they bring in Peter and um, they just open their circle to include um, whoever is in their proximity and that, um, you know, if you're here, you're family and we love you. And maybe we don't always get along like Dan and Felicity, um, not always getting along, um, but always, always being there for one another. And that just makes me so happily happy. And I think to, to jump off of that, one thing that I love about the King family is that, that it's not, they're not a dyad, it's not two people. So you can see the different relationships shifting. So when Felicity and Dan are arguing, they may relate more with other characters, but the family stays as a whole. I think that there's more stability because it's not just two people, that it's a, a collective. Right. Well, I think we'll I think we'll wrap things up here. So thank you very much, Caroline, for moderating the chat, and thank you to all of you who have been participating. Um, 
So yeah, well, this has been a fun experiment given that this is our first event where we don't have a program planned. It's just whatever, whoever wants to be here and whoever has anything to say. So this has been a lot of fun. Um, so coming up next with the, um, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, there is going to be a reading, baking and crafting challenge. Um, we will then read Chronicles of Avonlea on the readathon beginning March 1st. And so we will, we're also planning further uh, events on Zoom in the months to come. So stick around and uh, hope to look forward to seeing you again soon.